Thank you, uh, Dr. Anvari and Sages for uh, allowing us to give this talk. Um, so I'm going to uh, blow on through this. Uh, disclosure, I have no disclosures. We've already kind of mentioned this, um, multiple talks throughout um, sessions this week. Most of them focus on the intuitive or Da Vinci uh, platform, um, the SI, XI um, uh, systems. There's over 2,500 systems in the U.S. alone, uh, over 4,000 worldwide. It is the predominant robotic system. Whenever you mention robots, this is what comes up. Um, you have the, the standard models, uh, the estimated cost, which, which, which most of us are aware of, 1.2 million to over two and a half million dollars per machine. It has 3D visualization, articulating instruments, semi, sort of reusable instruments, um, varies. It could be one to 50 uses, and, um, and some are just one time. Um, but the key thing is, even though we mentioned these as robots, uh, as Dr. Anwari and uh, everyone has mentioned before, it's a master-slave technology. You still need surgeon input. There's no automation. There's no artificial intelligence. You still need a surgeon to uh, control these devices. And not much has changed since it first came out in 99. Uh, and if you look at the current systems, you still have a console where the surgeon sits and controls the instruments. You still have the patient cart where the arms are deployed. And then the, the vision tower where all the electronics are stored. Um, obviously, there's been an evolution in the technology, but the actual design has not changed. Applications, it started as a cardiac device. Uh, even at our institution, the, one of the first robots was placed for mitral valves, and uh, that surgeon is over at uh, over 2,200 uh, mitral valve procedures. But it didn't catch on everywhere across the world. Now it's coming back, but you're all, once they found prostatectomies and gynecologists, uh, for, for benign and um, oncologic uh, disease, that's where the robot technology took off uh, in widespread use. And throughout the years, the push has gone for colorectal, uh, thoracic, oncology back again, even ENT, um, doing TORS procedures uh, through the mouth. And then finally, general surgery, which mostly impacts uh, um, and has been one of the highest growths throughout the um, uh, procedures through worldwide. This was just came out uh, a month ago. Uh, uh, now breast surgeons are getting involved with robotics, plastic surgeons. Uh, this case was actually done a few months before, but they waited uh, to announce this, uh, a nipple sparing mastectomy. And if you've seen some of the marking, um, you can even have it in your cafeteria. Uh, it'll make you a sandwich. So in general surgery, where are we using this platform? Um, gallbladders, foregut procedures, Hellers, uh, one of the first publications was from Ohio State in 2001 for, uh, and made an argument for Heller myotomies and then suddenly it kind of dwindled down and made a comeback uh, back in 2011. Even they abandoned it um, secondary to cost. Bariatrics, colorectal, and now hernias. I show this data from Georgia. I mean, if you look at the worldwide data, the, the graphs are pretty intense. So, just looking at just in my state alone where the adoption was, and uh, we have some very robust, uh, robust systems in our, in our state. Most of it is coming from hernias, um, just inguinals and ventrals. That's where most of the growth in procedures have. In fact, if you just go backward, I don't think I can go backward, the red one, uh, let's see. Um, most of the other programs, minimum growth, but again, majority of the growth, um, 5,600 procedures done, and up, ooh, um, there we go, 2,200 of those were just hernias, and that's where uh, most of the push has gone, and, and that's where most of the applications are going right now. But there's more. There's not just one system. We always talk about one system, and that's where I want to focus for the rest of the talk, is showing you that there are multiple systems out there um, and where the technology is right now, not where it's heading. Um, Transenteric Synhance machine, it's been out for 10 to 12 years in Europe. Uh, they've been using it, but finally the FDA approved it last year in October. I think mainly to stir up some competition, and plus in the next two years we're going to see an onslaught of uh, robotic, quote, systems. It's essentially advanced laparoscopy. Um, they do have wristed instruments in Europe. They have not been approved here. They are smaller instruments. 
Um, and it has the key feature is haptic feedback. You can actually feel the tissue and, and feel some resistance. I actually think the posture is a little bit better. You're in a sitting position versus in a console leaning forward. And if you've seen most of the ergonomic studies, overall in er ergonomics is better, but they're actually seeing more C-spine injuries with the uh, intuitive system. There is an eye sensing camera. Basically, it watches your eyes and it tracks it. Um, uh, interesting enough, uh, one of my partners, uh, they haven't figured out all of it. Uh, certain faces or types of faces, uh, they're having some issues with the eye sensing movement. The Flex Robotic System, uh, another system that's actually been out since 2006, but uh, unless you have a robust ENT program, you may not even see this device. Um, it's essentially an, a, a robotic endoscope um, where the surgeon uses a joystick to um, get the device it in and then actually uses uh, wristed instruments. Uh, again, that's manual. There's nothing robotic about the instruments uh, to perform um, transoral procedures. It's not a cheap system. The cost is over a million dollars uh, when you look at it. So it's very hard for in, uh, investing just for ENT procedures. Um, thankfully, the FDA just approved it for transadomal procedures, so it could be used um, as like a notes procedure or actually uh, like a single port uh, uh, system platform. Monarch, uh, this was approved uh, at the end of March. If that name looks familiar, uh, Frederick Moll, he was one of the uh, uh, original in, uh, founders for Intuitive Surgical, but left about 10, 12 years ago. It's a system of flexible arms and cameras uh, with instruments. It's controlled by a joystick. It almost looks like an Xbox or a PlayStation device where you're uh, essentially navigating the bronchoscope in the lung and it's gonna be used targeted um, therapy for um, uh, biopsies and for a lung uh, tumor removal. The Spider Surgibot system, uh, Singapore Instrument Delivery Extended Release. Yeah, that's a mouthful. Um, but the Spider system was out uh, years ago. It was a manual device. It was more laparoscopy. Uh, Transenteric bought the technology and converted and added the computer platform to it and uh, essentially became Surgibot. 18 millimeter entry port. Uh, it has been deployed in other countries. Uh, just so there is FDA approval for Spider. But for surgery bot, there is no FDA approval, but it's been resubmitted and, and may be approved. We'll, we'll see what happens. Um, it is uh, manual control. You're at the patient's side. You're not sitting at another console, um, but you add a computer interface in between. And then you have the Titan Medical Sport device, which is available um, in, in a few other countries. Um, it's actually undergoing clinical trials in the U.S pending approval prior early 2019. Uh, there is a system in Florida. Florida seems to get, uh, it, just like Sinhans, uh, uh, the celebration hospitals and Florida hospitals tend to get these first. Uh, it's a single port access, uh, again, but it goes back to the console master-slave technology uh, with a um, uh, platform. Mirosurge, this is not an FDA-approved uh, uh, Device. It is a, in Germany, um, DLR Robotics. It's a subcontractor for the German Space Agency who makes remote controlled mechanical arms. They're individual arms, they're attached to the OR table and it's controlled via a joystick. Again, another console type device. Does have haptic feedback with four sensors and resistance feedback. Where this company is interesting, uh, where it gets interesting is Medtronic has bought the license for this tech. And this may be what Einstein is going to be. They've also invested in several other robotic companies. And I, I think when Einstein comes out, it's going to be some sort of hybrid uh, device. And just for completion's sake, um, uh, this is a mirror, the Revo, uh, Revo I. It's a South Korean uh, device. The S platform, the Da Vinci S platform, is off patents right now. So there are an onslaught of um, generic, let's say, say generic systems that are coming out. One's in China, this is in South Korea. It's a quarter of the cost of a comparable device, so you may start seeing these in, in uh, developing countries or where uh, cost is a big factor. So these are all systems that we may encounter in general surgery. Uh, and anytime you hear robotics, 
um, you, most of the negative press is uh, at least d driven towards robotics and general surgery. But other specialties have been using some sort of robotics or let's just say um, computer assisted devices, um, digital surgery for several, several years. And I want to highlight some of these systems that actually are probably sitting in your hospitals right now and you may not have been aware of. Um, the freehand uh, version 1.2, I guess there was a one point somewhere, uh, it's, a la it's a fancy laparoscopic holder. Um, they say hands-free control. The surgeon wears this device on, its, on, on his or her head. Uh, infrared signal goes to the monitor and it asks, before it actually moves it, you confirm it with a foot pedal. Um, there are laparoscopic holders out there. This is the first one that has a computer, or at least has some sort of hands-free um, integration into it. The Invideoscope uh, E200 system, um, available in Germany. Um, have not really seen this adopted here in the US. Um, it's a disposable, the interesting thing, it's a disposable single-use colonoscope. The handle is reusable, but the scope itself is disposable. Uh, the neat thing about this is as you're coming back, as, as the endoscopist is pulling back, you can enter diagnostic mode where the camera automatically moves in a 360 rotation, recording all the pictures so you can actually go back and look at your um, um, pictures later and lower chance of missing anything. Uh, the marketing focus is actually on the reduction of cost contamination, which at some facilities if you don't have uh, or have issues with sterility, which even we've encountered here in the US, um, you avoid that. The NeoGuide colonoscope, um, available since 2006, but I don't think most of us have seen this. Uh, Intuit owns this technology. Um, the main feature of this is it creates a 3D map for the surgeon as they're performing the endoscopy. Um, so if there's a, a patient with a redundant colon or difficult colon, you can actually go back and figure out where you're looping up uh, the, the scope. Let's move off to our vascular and cardiology colleagues, the Sensei X2 robotic system. Um, this has evolved for several years. This system has been in play for over 10, 15 years. Now they've kind of jumped on the robotic name. Uh, Hansen Medical uh, owns this device, and Viacath was the original catheter-guided system. You sit at a console. Um, uh, I couldn't find this picture, but the setup is similar, and I'll show you the, what the Magellan is. Uh, this one is purely used for atrial ablation, so uh, the cardiologist can, once they get access, can drive this catheter up into the atrium and then do targeted therapy. There is haptic feedback, so if you hit something against the wall, they do feel it. And then on that play, uh, the Magellan robot says, so the only difference is this arm. Uh, this is more tailored towards vascular procedures. Uh, the catheters can go down to six French, and they're actually working on smaller catheters. Same concept. But if you look at your hybrid rooms, you may, this may be in there already, and you're not even aware of it. These systems do cost up to a million dollars. The whole hybrid rooms can cost up to $3 million, and um, uh, most uh, major hospitals have these devices. This is what uh, the core path GRX looks like. This is a uh, pure hybrid room. Same thing, you sit uh, at a, not a really a console, but you have joystick control with image guidance and you can place coronary guide wires, dense balloons um, away from the patient. Uh, they're touting this for less, you know, again, they can get away with it, less radiation risk for the surgeon, um, but like you said, these are built into the new hybrid rooms that are at most of our facilities. Let's move on to our neurosurgery colleagues and ortho, uh, ortho colleagues. They have this sitting in every room. Um, the MedTech IST, other variations, companies of these. Uh, basically, these are fancy GPS systems. Um, it helps them, um, if you have pre-existing imaging, you can cross-reference it and help uh, target uh, shunt placement uh, if they're doing any sort of electrophysiology um, uh, uh, techniques for Parkinson's, uh, this helps them um, drill precisely into those areas. Mazo Robotics, um, based in Israel, does something similar. It's great for spine and uh, spinal surgeries, especially for scoliosis. Uh, Medtronic has invested 70, over 72 million in this tech as well. Um, this may be uh, part of their Einstein robot as well. That's where it's making a lot of publicity right now. Um, Dr. Murray also mentioned the Stryker Mako uh, system. 
uh, helps with knee and hip replacements. Essentially, any pre-existing imaging, the device will take it, uh, process that picture, and make a 3D map of the joint. And then, actually, the surgeon can direct targeted therapy for joint replacements or shaving the bone in precise locations with small incisions. And then the Navio, um, it's a, uh, Smith and Nephew makes it, it's, a, it's a, for specific for knee surgery right now, it looks like a fancy drill, but it again uses 3D mapping to uh, create precise uh, drill marks uh, for knee replacements and surgeries. So in summary, robots are already here, it's current technology, but we have to use those words uh, carefully. It's computer assisted or digital surgery right now, it's still a master slave um, most of these, as you've seen, uh, and as Dr. Anmari uh, mentioned in his previous talk, the automation is not here yet, uh, but hopefully that's where we're going towards. Majority, uh, again, like I said, command-driven by a surgeon, and there's multiple options available. The main point I want to make is other specialties have had this for several, several years, yet when we're trying to make an argument for the robot or trying to add systems or upgrade our systems, we, we usually get a lot of pushback, yet other specialties have this, and they have something similar, uh, and it's sitting in the OR. So we, the more educated we are about these systems and multiple specialties, we can work together um, uh, to, to come up with um, future purchases. And then the key thing is there's rapid updates, evolution of these systems, but nothing dramatic has happened in the current technology, and hopefully uh, our next speaker can help um, elucidate um, what's coming up next. Knowledge is. All right. I'll set you up there.